We've seen some examples before um, where we used lists in Python, but I'd like to take a little bit of time and give some more detail about lists. So syntactically in the language, we can use square brackets as shown here to indicate that something is a list. For example, square brackets with nothing between them is an empty list, a list that has nothing in it. Whereas this one here has square brackets 4, 3, 12, 9. And that means that it creates a list with these four integers in it. So you can see that we separate items by commas, and these items could be numbers, they could be strings, though those strings, as you'll remember, need to have quotes around them. Um, they could be lots of other different kinds of data. At later points, you may even create lists of lists or more complex things like that. But for now, we've got this list with four integers in it. We can also grow lists by adding two lists together. For example, if we have this list with four or five, and then this other list with three, two, nine, and we put plus between them, Python knows what to do in this case. The plus operator works on lists by combining those two lists together. It keeps the order that you saw them in here. So this would now be four, five, three, two, nine, and it will create a new list. Now we would typically want to make sure that we stored that as a variable or did something with it because otherwise we've just said put those two lists together and then do nothing with them. So down here you can see I've created this variable my list. I've set it equal to the list that contains four three. And another way that I can grow my list is by using functions that belong to the list, like append. Append will take a single value and add it onto the list, so it changes the list. If I now printed out my list, for example, then I would get 4, 3, 6, because append adds to the far right end, to the end of the list there. One note here, because we haven't done this before, is that when you have some variable and you put a dot after it, that allows you to call functions that belong to that variable's type. So lists have lots of different functions that we'll see more of later. And similarly, other Python types like strings Strings also have some functions that you can call, like converting them to uppercase or to lowercase. So what we're doing when we use that dot is we're asking our data that's in that variable if we can use some function that belongs to it to change the data in some way or to create something new. In this case, it changes the original list by appending 6 to the end of it. Another thing that we'll commonly want to do is we'll want to see how long a list is. For example, if we were given a list by someone else's code, then we might need to check the length of that list to see how much we're dealing with there. So we can use this built-in len function to check the length of the list, how many items are in it. So it would report for this list here that there are four items in it seven, five, six, and seven. It doesn't care that there are duplicates or anything like that. Lists are allowed to contain duplicates and length is only going to report how many items are in there total, not necessarily how many unique items. You could write your own code to check for how many unique items and there are other data structures that are really useful for making sure that you don't have duplicates as well. Here's another list. It kind of mixes types of numbers, and this is an important thing to recognize about lists in Python. Lists are not very strict in what you're storing in them. You could have a number and a string in your list or any combination of different types of data stored in that list. 
So here we have two integers and then a real number, also sometimes referred to as a float or a floating point number. The decimal place sort of floats around in it is one way to think of that, that term that the decimal place, if we multiply or divide, can move around at what location it should be. Whereas in an integer, the decimal place is always at the end and there are always zeros after it, and so we don't even show it. Here, if I ask for the length of my list, it will report three because there are three items, 8, 26, and 5.5555. And then finally, we have an example where the length would be zero because the list is empty. It has no items in it. We saw in our discussion on loops that you can loop through the items in a list. And here we're going to uh, show some more advanced versions of that and dig a little deeper into what we are actually doing here. So we've taken some list in and we're looping through all of the items in that input list. We've taken it as a parameter. We're not going to change the input list if you look here, because we're building a result list. This is often something that we'll do with lists. Start with an empty list and then append items onto it. So here we're taking each item from the input list. We are multiplying it by two, putting it in our result list by calling append, and then we're returning our result list. So if you give me 8, 26, and 5, then call double a list on that list. Notice that it had to be stored in a variable so that we could do that. Then 8 will get doubled, we'll get 16, 26 will get doubled, we'll get 52, and 5 will get doubled, we'll get 10. So it evaluates to 16, 52, 10, which is as you can see in here, a new list, my list, the variable my list would still be 8265, but the result from calling double a list with my list would be a new list that contains 16, 52, and 10. And here we've got another example where we've used two variables to build up our list. And that's just fine because you'll remember that variables are sort of just a name for a value. And so essentially what I'm doing when I create my list here is I'm getting the value seven through the variable name. So I'm using the variable name code number and that's allowing me to have seven in my list as the first entry. I'm using the variable name lock number, which references 13 as the second entry in my list. So this list is in other words, just seven, 13. And so again, I use this list based accumulator pattern here where I'm building up a new list. And I start from an empty list. I loop through everything in my input, which would be seven and 13. I will double seven to get 14 as my first entry in the result here. And then I will double 13 to get 26 as the second entry in my result here. And again, as before, my list won't be changed, code number won't be changed, and lock number won't be changed because we're creating a new list and we're appending items onto it that are just double whatever the input and items were. Sometimes when we're looping over a list's items, we don't need to build a new list. For example, if we want to get the sum or the product of things that are in a list, well, the result will be a number, not a new list. So we're still doing this accumulator kind of pattern, but because what we want is a number, then our result has to be a number. So do pay attention when you're doing things like the product of some numbers or the sum or whatever kind of accumulation you're doing, it's really important to ask yourself what the starting value for your accumulator needs to be. For instance, with sums, 
you usually want to start your sum at zero and then add items to it as you go through the list. Many beginning programmers then when they're asked to do multiplicative things like the product will also start the result at zero. But if we start the result at zero and we're doing result times each item, then result or zero times anything is zero, zero times anything else is zero, and so on, and we will always come away with zero as our result. So do be careful that you choose the starting value for your accumulator appropriately to the problem that you're doing. When we're multiplying, we probably want to start with one. And so for each item in the list, we will take that starting value one first, with the first item from the list, we will multiply one times that first item, and then we'll keep the result of that, loop back, get the next item, multiply by that item with the result, and so on. So let's step through our example. We've given 8 to 5 and stored it as my list. Then we call product of list on my list. So now we are taking that as the input list when we look up at product of list and execute the function. The result starts at 1. Then my i will first be 8. So 1 times 8 gives me 8. Then we'll store that as result before the loop continues back to the top and gets 2. So then we will have already 8 as our result, because 8 times 1 gave us 8. And now we'll be doing 2 times 8. I'm sorry, 8 times 2, because our result was 8. And our i from the list will be the second item, 2. And so 16 will get stored as our result. Then we'll flip back up to the top. i becomes the next item, 5. And then we'll do 16 times 5 get the result of that, store it as result. Now our loop has nothing left to step through. There is no next item. So our loop will end and we'll return the result of multiplying 16 and 5 as the final result there. So the again, the list will not change because we're creating something new. We're not changing the items in the list and we'll get some result. We should probably, again, do something with it. We didn't really do anything here, so we might want to print it or save it in a variable or whatever our plan is for next steps from there. So here we've learned a little more about lists that we can define them by using these square brackets. They can be empty or they can have items in them. Those items can be the same type or different types. And we can even provide those items by inputting variable names here, and the list will hold the values that those variables reference. We can append to our lists to grow the list and make it bigger. We can also add lists together to get new resulting lists. And that we're able to loop over the items in the list and do interesting things with them, things like creating a new list based on the original or creating some result based on the data that's stored inside that list.